Welcome everyone to the Canadian Nurses Association's webinar series, Progress in Practice. This webinar, Supporting Nurses to Choose Wisely, Starting Conversations to Reduce Overuse of Tests, Treatments and Interventions that Lack Benefits or Cause Harm. This session is being recorded for nurses who are unable to participate today. My name is Carrie Schuhendler, and I'm a registered nurse and program lead in public policy at the Canadian Nurses Association, and I will be hosting this webinar. At the end of the presentation, we will answer your questions, which you can type into the Q&A box that you see to the right of your slide. We will address as many questions as time allows. And now a little bit about our presenter, Madeline Ashcroft. Madeline has extensive clinical and management experience in infection control for acute chronic, long-term care, and rehabilitation hospitals. While serving as the Infection Prevention and Control, or IPAC, Canada Nursing Representative to the Canadian Network of Nursing Specialties over the past five years, Madeline also serves as the IPAC Canada Standards and Guidelines Committee Chair and as an active member of the Core Competencies Working Group. She has been involved in a number of CNA initiatives, including representing the Public Health Agency of Canada's planning project for clinical guidance during influenza pandemics and providing IPAC recommendations to inform CNA's position statement on RN influenza immunization. A little bit of background about Choosing Wisely Canada. Choosing Wisely Canada is a national campaign that was initially led by physicians to help clinicians and patients to engage in conversations to avoid tests, treatments, and procedures that could cause harm or lack benefit. The Canadian Nurses Association was the first non-physician group to develop Choosing Wisely Canada recommendations. These are some of the promotional materials from the Choosing Wisely campaign, and you may be familiar with some of them. It's just one example using their tagline, more is not always better. And now I'll hand it over to Madeline to talk about uh, CNA's IPAC nursing list. Thanks very much, Kerry. Um, it's my pleasure to be with you today and uh, discuss this list that uh, we are so enthusiastic about. Um, I forgot to mention to, to include in my introduction that I am fortunate also to be serving on the board of the CNA um, representing the network of nursing specialties up until June when my term is up and it's been a wonderful experience. Um, I um, like to think of choosing wisely as something that highlights that too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. And um, with that in mind, we will uh, explore our list. So what was our process? Um, CNA asked us as uh, IPAC nurses, would you like to uh, be the first to do uh, the nurse list? And um, as you're probably aware, that there was already a nursing list from CNA uh, that Carrie mentioned, and it was decided that the specialty nursing groups could put forward lists. And, and um, we were told that because infection prevention control is sort of something that everybody does, every nurse and everyone in healthcare, that we were privileged to be the first group. So we got that request. We recruited eight members from across the country. They all had to be infection prevention and control experts who were members of IPAC Canada and also CNA members. And um, what we did was a very organized process that CNA provided us with, which was great, that we looked at all the items from Choosing Wisely Canada Specialty Societies and pulled out any that were to do with infection prevention and control. And again, the American Academy of Nursing Choosing Wisely list as well. And we looked at a number of new items. We actually, between us all, generated, I think, 66 others, uh, including from reviewers. Uh, so we had a total of 298 items um, that we um, had appraised by two independent reviewers and validated for relevance to nursing through a structured process that CNA developed. So we, we narrowed those down. And I um, wanted to point out our team, um, and thanks to all of you. Um, I know some of you are on the line for your participation, um, because this was um, not a lot of notice and quite a bit of, of work reviewing things and tweaking things and so on. So uh, there, there's me representing Ontario. We didn't want to be Ontario-centric, so I was the only representative from Ontario. Um, Vi Burton from Saskatchewan, Alyssa Cuff from Newfoundland, Karen Party from uh, Northwest Territories, 
Craig Piankowski from BC, Patsy Rolling from Nova Scotia, Ramona Rodriguez from Quebec, Samantha Stewart from the Yukon, and Carrie from CNA. So continuing our process, once we had those, those items, we kept doing more and more rounds of review and revision using a modified Delphi process to continually refine the list and adapt down uh, to from a semi-final 30 items to the final consensus on an eight item list. So we did um, literature reviews as well for all these items to make sure we had the most recent and uh, concise evidence to support the, each item on the list as well as um, any nursing research that was appropriate. Then again, we went out to nursing experts and patient safety, members of the Canadian Network of Nursing Specialties, various patient advocates, CNA jurisdictional members, so those are the board members as well, and CNA nursing members generally, as well as the Canadian Association for Drugs and, and Technologies in Health, and Choosing Wisely Canada's internal clinical reviewers, who were a pretty tough bunch. Um, so we got lots of very constructive feedback on the items, and that led us in this vigorous process and rigorous process to our, our path for approval. So we were almost there. We had eight items, um, but then we were told hand hygiene just didn't fit. So we were able to incorporate that into the glove item. So we came up with a final lucky seven number <laughs> list. And um, in September 2017, both the CNA and IPAC Canada boards gave the list their full approval and endorsement and the lists were launched in November 2017. We had hoped to have them launched in October for Infection Control Week, but um, we had two typed uh, timelines regarding the board meetings, but they were approved and they are now out there in circulation. So this is a, a snapshot of, of our, our list, um, and we're gonna provide you with the links as well so that you can, uh, you know, go to the links and have a look. There's the general, when you go to the Choosing Wisely Canada website, you'll see the general list first from the Canadian Network of, uh, Canadian Nurse Association. And then you will see the infection prevention and control list immediately after that. And there's a method in the madness there because the idea is that they flow from each other. And so as I'll mention later, we, we made sure that we didn't repeat anything that was in the general list, even if it was strongly infection prevention and control. So let's look at our list. The first uh, item here um, was don't do a urine dip or send urine specimens for culture unless urine retract symptoms are present. And um, this goes nicely with the, with the general CNA nurses list that had don't insert an indwelling urinary catheter or leave it in place without daily assessment. The second item on our list is don't recommend antibiotics for infections that are likely viral in origin, such as an influenza-like illness. The third is don't overuse gloves. Next is don't send unnecessary or improperly collected specimens for testing. This item is don't collect stool that is not diarrhea for, for clostridium difficile testing or test for cure. The sixth item is don't prolong the use of invasive devices. And the seventh is don't shave hair for medical procedures. Use clippers if hair removal is required. So um, there's another item on the Canadian nurses list. Don't recommend antimicrobials to treat bacteriuria in older adults unless specific urinary tract symptoms are present. So you'll see that that fits in as well with some of ours, but it is a, it's a different um, complimentary recommendation. How do we get our order? Well, all items here are important, but it's ordered in a way, and we had some debate over this obviously from our reviewers as well as our own group, about the potential impact of each of these. Is this common practice? Is it common practice amongst nurses in a variety of settings? Could it potentially lead to a severe illness or possibly death? 
So we looked at the risk as, as, as such for each of these items and tried to order it in, uh, accordingly. So let's look at the description and rationale of each of these in turn. So here's our first one. Don't do a urine dip or send urine specimens for culture unless urinary tract symptoms are present. Well, I'm sure we all realize that uh, urine testing is very common. It's a routine thing for admissions, routine physicals, and, and sometimes also when patients, residents, or clients just don't seem to feel well or seem right. Um, you know, quick, do a quick urine. And um, we should only really be testing when somebody's got urinary tract symptoms. And we'll talk about what those are. Um, pain, dysuria, urinary discomfort, frequency, urgency, suprapubic or flank pain, or with or without fever. Um, dark, cloudy, or foul-smelling urine may indicate inadequate fluid intake or some dietary change and not necessarily an infection. But people are often like, well, the urine smelled funny or it looked funny, so I took a specimen. Um, also, delirium on its own is not considered a symptom of cystitis in a non-catheterized individual. So um, behavioral changes may be related to a urinary tract uh, infection, but that would not be your first consideration. You would explore further before you started sending urines and giving antibiotics, for example. Um, once you send the specimen, 50% or so of, of individuals do have bacteria, uh, bacteria in the urine or bacteriuria without localizing symptoms. So this is an asymptomatic bacteriuria. And for those over 65, especially those living in um, long-term care homes, the rates are much higher, especially for women. So if you're going to send specimens off, you're going to find something, and then the onus is on the prescriber to do something about it. Well, individuals may be chronically colonized, but not infected. So they're not actually having any uh, systematic body response to the organisms that are in the urine. And therefore, they really don't need this treated. If you start treating it, you're going to just add to side effects of the antibiotics, as well as the risk of um, killing off the, the organism and creating uh, partially and creating resistance, or killing off all the organisms in the bowel and letting C. difficile arise and with the, you know, causing very severe health outcomes. So we really need to be careful about what we do in, in the way of testing urines and, and, and moving forward on those. Um, there are a few minor exceptions. For example, screening in early pregnancy, and there's clear guidelines for that, and screening for a, asymptomatic bacteriuria before any urological procedures where there might be some mucosal bleeding. So if you're going to go in there and do instrumentation and there's bacteria in the urine, you probably want that cleared for the procedure. But otherwise, routinely, we shouldn't be sending off those specimens. The dips especially are, seem to be quite routine. OK, our second item on the list is don't recommend antibiotics for infections that are likely viral in origin such as influenza-like illness. We all know that most upper, vast majority of upper respiratory infections are actually viral. And antibiotics are, as you know, rarely indicated, could lead to adverse effects, which we have talked about already, but, you know, particularly the increased resistance in that individual and the impact for the larger society. So we know with the things like antimicrobial drugs that they're probably the only treatment that not only impacts the person, but the bigger world out there. Treating one person has a big impact, potentially, on the rest of, of society. Antiviral drugs are what you should give if you're giving anything for a viral disease. And uh, they are authorized, as you know, for influenza treatment and prophylaxis in Canada. But they need to be given in certain uh, situations. So patient risk needs to be considered, relevant history, duration and severity of symptoms. You'll often find these um, being given, for example, in outbreaks in long-term care homes or even in hospitals for influenza during that season. 
but as a routine thing, they probably should be avoided. We had a lot of pushback on this at times about, well, nurses don't necessarily order antibiotics. And, um, well, nurse practitioners do, and nurses may as our role expands in the future. Um, I think we really need to think about the unique role of nurses in antimicrobial stewardship. We are responsible not only for understanding the action of any medication that we actually administer, but we're also required to, to confirm the dose, the route, and the appropriateness for each individual patient, resident, or client that we administer to it. We are his or her advocate. So we need to um, you know, seize that role, and I think there's a lot of recognition that nurses are an untapped resource in the fight for antimicrobial stewardship, and there are some studies that are currently underway, um, not only internationally but also locally. So if you feel that the medication is not appropriate, we do, you do have the responsibility to discuss these concerns with the prescribers if you're not the prescriber. And to reassure the, the patient, client, resident that there are other things that they can do to alleviate the symptoms of an influenza-like illness without resorting to um, antimicrobials. Okay, the next one um, is uh, one that is novel. So this is a new item that had never been on any of the lists before, and we were very happy that we got to have a couple of novel items. This and the shaving item are, are, are novel. So this item it includes that gloves should only be worn when there's a risk of contact with broken skin, blood or body fluids, mucous membranes, or contaminated surfaces, or for additional contact precautions, or for contact with chemicals, for example, during environmental cleaning, preparing chemotherapy, and so on. You need to do your point of care risk assessment to assess whether there's that risk of contact with blood and broken skin and so on before you put your gloves on. Um, you need to put those gloves on immediately before you're doing a task, take them off right after, and clean your hands. Um, we also actually recommend your hands are clean before you put the gloves on because you could potentially um, contaminate the box of gloves, just getting the gloves out, and also the gloves could tear, may have microscopic holes in them, and any germs on your hands multiply in that warm, moist environment. Um, when the task requires gloves, you may have to make sure that you are using them appropriately, not double gloving, triple gloving. I know that we sometimes did that during our Ebola training, but it really is not good practice. So we need to think seriously about it. I know it's done in ORs, uh, but that is because of the fear of rupture of the gloves during surgery. We shouldn't be doing it in general day-to-day uh, -day work. We shouldn't be wearing gloves for social contact or contact with intact skin or clean surfaces. Just not necessary. Some of the things that we, that we do, for example, social touch, would be shaking hands. Um, if you're just taking a blood pressure or helping a client to get dressed, you don't need to put gloves on. The connotation also for the patient, client, or resident is that, ooh, I'm Jeremy, I can't be touched without gloves even to just shake my hand or do my blood pressure. Gloves need to be used appropriately and changed appropriately during the care or the task done for each individual. Gloves should not be substituted for hand hygiene. And hand hygiene, as you all know, is the single most important way to prevent transmission of infection. And alcohol-based hand rub is the preferred method in healthcare for hand hygiene. We wanted the hand hygiene item to stand free here, but we were told no, so we were able to put it in here with the gloves. So we still got our big important thing about hand hygiene. Um, if you have to wear gloves, after cleaning your hands, you need to let them dry before you put the gloves on. So you're not going to have chronic irritant contact dermatitis. There's a lot of studies being done right now, certainly in Ontario, about this. So you'll see some best practice coming out of Ontario in the next year or so. 
once the skin on your hands, and let's face it, I mean, yes, one pair of feet, nurses do a lot of walking, but more and more so we do a lot of touching, one pair of hands as well. Your hands are your livelihood as a nurse, and you've got to protect them and protect the surfaces of them. So if you overwashed your hands and then you're rubbing with a towel and so on, you're going to get sore hands, and the skin is broken, and then they're lovely ground for colonization with organisms. So there's a number of reasons why we need to keep our hands intact and, and, and well looked after. There's a quote at the bottom of the, of the page here, and it's in the, um, it's in the list. It's very hard to read here, but it basically is from Health Canada, the Public Health Agency of Canada. And it says, an alcohol-based hand rub is the preferred method of hand hygiene in healthcare settings unless exceptions apply, i.e., when hands are visibly soiled with organic material, if exposure to norovirus and potential spore-forming pathogens such as Clostridium difficile is strongly suspected or proven, including outbreaks involving these organisms. So that is our reference because, yes, it's best to wash with soap and water if you've been dealing with someone with diarrhea, vomiting, or C. diff, because of the risk of fecal matter getting on your hands. But bear in mind also that you do have gloves on if you're doing this, and you so the big chunks will be kept off. And also, um, you shouldn't really be using the, uh, the the patient or resident or client sink that they've been washing in to clean your hands. It's probably heavily contaminated. So you might want to just use alcohol-based hand rub till you can get to a clean sink instead of uh, using a contaminated one. So this is this is all a key message, not just from um, from us at IPAC Canada, but also our government, internationally, World Health Organization and nationally the Just Clean Your Hands for moments. Okay, so that was a, quite a big item. The next one is more concise. Don't sp uh, send unnecessary or improperly collected specimens for testing. And there was a lot of discussion on this one as well. But um, some of the key things here are people sometimes just send routine swabs for screening. Oh, persons come into an emergency or come into our, our unit or area, we'll just send all these swabs on. Well, if there's no clinical evidence of infection, such as incisions or, or eye infections, why are swabs being done routinely? So that needs to be questioned. You don't just do it, even just for MRSA testing. Um, there, there has to be a policy, um, and it may not apply to every single person. So think about that. Also, if you're swabbing infected uh, skin, tissue, or a wound, if that's the best you can do, and, and the best way, obviously, to collect a specimen from a wound bed is through aspiration through cleansed intact skin at, uh, outside the, the wound border. But if you have to take it from the, the, the wound or the skin or the tissue, you should clean that area with sterile saline before you do that in order to re reduce the surface contaminants. So you're actually um, getting a culture from the wound bed and not just skin commensals that have covered the area. Don't take a specimen of the discharge unless it's specifically ordered. So if you, you know, if the order is um, a culture of the exudate or a culture of the drainage, that's one thing. But um, we like to say in infection control, don't swab the gob. So don't just take it, you know, oh, that's a nice bit of pus there, I'll take a specimen of that. No, you want to know what's actually growing in the wound and not just surface contaminants. Improperly collected or, or poor quality specimens, including swabs, often lead to inappropriate uh, antimicrobial therapy. So if something comes back, oh, we'll prescribe accordingly. And so people maybe get, get getting put on antibiotics or antimicrobials for a, something that's just a, a skin commensal or a colonization. And not only does that have impacts for patient safety and patient care, but also adds to the cost for laboratory and pharmacy. And our next uh, item on the list is don't collect stool that's not diarrhea for clostridium infection test or for test for cure. So this sometimes gets ordered, you know, um, C. diff testing and the, the person has a formed stool. Well, the labs usually reject these, thank goodness, but you really need to have a specimen that is actual, actually diarrhea 
which means it takes the shape of the container that you put it in. Um, if the individuals had a prior nucleic acid amplification test result within the past seven days, like a PCR test, um, again, you shouldn't be repeating it because it's not going to add to your, add to your knowledge if they've already got a positive result on, on the board. Um, you might do it if it was negative, but the symptoms can, can continue. And obviously not as a test for cure, because once you've got C. diff in your bowel, and, and you know up to 80% of newborns have it, and you know anywhere, you know average I think uh, estimate for adults is about 11% of people naturally have it in their bowel without symptoms. So if it's found in their bowel and they don't have symptoms, they're probably just colonized, and there is no real risk to this. The same thing goes for tests for cure. Um, you think, oh, the diarrhea has stopped, so we've got to send a specimen off. But um, the colonization can go on indefinitely. So the only con the time you need to do the contact precautions, really, is while there are symptoms, while they still have diarrhea. And after that, it's not really required. And no further testing should be required unless the diarrhea returns. And there is a 30% relapse rate post-treatment, by the way. Okay, our next item is don't prolong the use of invasive devices. And so this, uh, this got tweaked quite a lot as well because, um, you know, which ones do we actually put in? We might put a peripheral catheter in as nurses. We might put a Foley catheter in, but that's captured again in the regular nurses in nursing list or the overall nursing list. So we didn't want, we wanted to make it slightly different. So we included things such as central venous catheters and endotracheal tubes. We may not be putting those in, but we are there when they're put in, and we can advocate for consideration. So anything like this breaches skin and body integrity, as you know, and becomes portal of entry for infection to get into the body. So they shouldn't be used without a specific indication, which is determined by appropriate clinical assessment and definitely not left in place without daily reassessment. And this is also part of the um, patient safety literature, too, in the checklist, that you don't um, leave anything in without saying, does this person need this tube today? And how long has it been in? And so on. Again, we're not putting them in, but we all have that influence when they are being inserted, when they're being maintained, and when they're being removed. We are, again, the advocates for our patients, clients, and, and residents. Okay, and our final item here is don't shave hair for medical procedures. Use clippers if hair removal is required. And this is relatively recent, but shaving hair, as we all know, can result in microscopic cuts and abrasions to the underlying skin surface. So thereby opening up potential sites for infection to enter. The international recommendations now are only to remove hair if it interferes with a surgical procedure. And shaving prior to surgery actually increases infection rates when compared to clipping, use of depilatories, or non-removal of hair. So if hair must be removed, clipper use is sufficient for any body part, and uh, razor use is not appropriate for any operative site, and this is straight from the World Health Organization. Um, to facilitate better contact with electrodes, you know, for, for monitoring someone's uh, heartbeat, et cetera, or vascular access device dressings and so on, and you need to remove the hair to let these things adhere, you really should be using surgical clippers. And um, some are, have a disposable uh, head to them, or some can be cleaned and disinfected with a reusable head. Any clippers that you're using need, as, as it mentions there, to be used as close as possible to the time of surgery. So gone are the days in the old, where, you know, in the olden days where everybody got, you know, shaved the day before surgery and so on. Now it's, you know, as close as possible to the time of incision to reduce the risk. So those are our items. And here you will find the links to the news release from Choosing Wisely. 
as well as the full list of, of, um, on the Canadian Nurses Association website. And the Choosing Wisely Canada website, as I mentioned before, has the nursing list first and then the IPAC nursing list following that. They also provide all the references for each item. We did initially put the references in this presentation, but they've just list and list and so on. So have a look at the references too. Um, if, if others are asking you for advice, um, we, dry, we did put the, the best references we could find without being overwhelming. And I'm going to hand this back over to Carrie to talk a little bit more about the various associations and, and our role. Wonderful. Thanks, Madeline. So uh, just a little bit about the Canadian Nurses Association. CNA represents registered nurses from 10 provincial and territorial nursing associations and call colleges, independent registered nurses from members, members from Ontario and Quebec, as well as retired registered nurses from across the country. CNA advances the practice and profession of nursing to improve health outcomes and strengthen Canada's publicly funded, not-for-profit health system. Uh, the Infection Prevention and Control Canada. IPAC Canada is a multidisciplinary professional organization for those engaged in the prevention and control of infections. IPAC Canada was incorporated under the Canadian Corporation Act in 1976 and is a registered nonprofit organization. IPAC Canada has over 1,600 members and is one of 46 associations in the Canadian Network of Nursing Specialties. And Choosing Wisely Canada. Choosing Wisely Canada is a campaign to help physicians and patients engage in conversations about unnecessary tests, treatments, and procedures, and to try to help physicians and patients make smart and effective choices to ensure high-quality care. What's new, as you know, is that it, it now involves nurses and other clinicians as well. So we're really excited for this interdisciplinary approach to Choosing Wisely Canada, and we're thrilled that the Canadian Nurses Association and our partners in the Canadian Network of Nursing Specialties, including IPAC Canada, have helped us to branch this campaign out broader than just physicians. We will now start with the discussion portion of the webinar. If you haven't already, please type your questions into the Q&A box that you see to the right of the slide. Also, um, some participants are asking if the slides will be available after the webinar. Uh, you can see that they are listed in the files pod below, so you're welcome to download them there, along with the Choosing Wisely um, uh, list and uh, your webinar certificate. So we have a couple of questions. Um, I'll start with one uh, from a registrant. So uh, do you find infection control practices are getting out of hand and could lead to people having no immunity to anything? I question some things we are expected to do in the name of infection control and sometimes wonder if it's overkill. So Madeline, your thoughts? Yes, well, I, I smiled at this because sometimes I begin to think that way in certain settings as well. And I think we've all heard that we, you know, things like we all need to eat a pound of dirt during our lives and, and so on. And um, recent studies on asthma and allergies seem to indicate that early exposure to allergens, like letting your kids play in a barn, can uh, help reduce allergies later in life. So I think there are there's some truth about that. Maybe we become overly clean in our in our home setting or child raising settings. However, healthcare is a very different situation. And so what I'd, what I'd like to highlight is that each year in Canada, healthcare associated infections still affect more than 220,000 Canadians and result in 8,500 to 12,000 deaths. And despite our interventions, those rates are not really going down. One in nine hospital patients in Canada gets a healthcare associated infection and infections are still the fourth leading cause of death in Canada. So the infections in our patients and residents and clients cannot infrequently be traced back to care providers. When you think about long-term care home outbreaks, you have the staff list and the, and the residents list, and you know, often the first case was a staff member who felt they were in, you know, indispensable, had to go in, or maybe with influenza, you know, you're infectious, for 24 hours before your symptoms appear. So, you know, we are vectors to, to bring infection to, to those we care for. I think that um, as the largest group of healthcare providers, nurses also have the most contact with our patients, residents, and clients. And those individuals themselves are getting progressively 
more immunocompromised. When you think about all the wonders of modern medicine and science and healthcare and how people are living longer and longer um, with chronic diseases, including you know cancers and so on that wipe out their immune systems, um, and how people are living longer overall as well, um, the population is is becoming progressively more immunocompromised. So I think we've got a really vital role in, in doing whatever we can to prevent infection for those vulnerable people in our care. So I hope that um, that's answered your question to some degree. Yes, in some settings we may be going over the top, but in others we're still not doing enough. Wonderful. Thanks, Madeline. And any advice in dealing with clients requesting tests to follow up uh, advice from an alternate care provider or advice on how to deal with clients who are um, perhaps a little bit anxious and want repeat testing. I know with, uh, with Choosing Wisely Canada, um, you know, that's one of the things that clinicians talk about that, uh, you know, will their patients or clients feel that they're still doing a good job if they're not actually doing tests or treatments? So what, what advice might you have? Well, I think this is a great question too and I, I think um, I think we need to start with our putting our nurses' hats on, right? So to to listen to the the client's concern, right? Hear them out. Don't jump in right in with an answer. Ask about their concerns. Where is this coming from? What have you been told? And and so on. And I think sometimes the presence of another person, uh, or maybe quite often, provides comfort and support well beyond the actual therapy or treatment that's being given. So perhaps they're going for a massage or something and, and, uh, or therapeutic touch or various other uh, treatments that, that are helping to focus on them and helping them to feel better. And, um, you know, I don't think there's harm in that. I think there's a lot of benefit in that. I mean, we're all working together, um, you know, to help that individual feel and be better. But when they're coming up with things like, oh, I should try some you know, B pollen injections or I need to have a series of ultrasounds and x-rays, whatever. Um, I think as nurses we are also not only a caring but a knowledgeable profession and we have to refer back to the science. So go back to your evidence-based guidelines and interventions and focus on those, make recommendations on those. Um, I find that the Choosing Wisely list can help, not just ours but the antimicrobial stewardship ones as well. Uh, we also have the PACT uh, guidelines, P-A-A-C-T, or Mums Health, and um, I can provide the, um, I can type in the, the link for those, but you may have heard of those. They've been around for about 20 years now. The first edition of the Anti-Infective Guidelines for Community Acquired Infections was launched, and, and they're a great tool. So for about $25, you can buy the orange book. Um, they have a series of books now, not just anti-infective guidelines, but relevant to different specialty areas. But they have very useful information, and I know all the nurse practitioners that I work with and have worked with in the recent past have copies, and they actually show the patients, look, here you see, the recommendation in the field is to have plenty of fluids and rest and Tylenol, whatever, and not antibiotics, and this is the reason why. So there are those sort of tools. There's also many, many antimicrobial stewardship programs and resources and websites, not just uh, nationally but provincially and territorially, as well as local in your health organizations and international ones. So there's a big drive for this. There's a lot of posters that you'll see in doctors' offices now that say if you have flu, you know. So. Uh, you don't need an antibiotic. And it really does help, I think, to have those rapid tests as well, where people's minds are put at ease, okay, in a, in a physician's office or a nurse practitioner's office, that, no, you don't have strep throat, you don't need an antibiotic, or, no, you don't have influenza, and therefore do not need an antiviral, et cetera. So those are just some of the ideas I, I, I could think of. Wonderful. Thanks, Madeline. Um, another question. Uh, merging a couple of questions that we had. There's a question about, you know, what was the issue regarding hand hygiene? And, and another comment um, is that one of the participants was surprised uh, to learn that alcohol-based hand rub is the recommended first choice of hand cleaning product um, because they had thought that regular soap 
uh, and water was the, the optimal choice. So if you could maybe speak to hand hygiene, which I know is IPAC's, yeah. um, you know, most important <laughs> item, that would be great. Okay, thanks. So sometimes I can say, oh, here we go, hand hygiene again, and I've been teaching it for about 20 years. And um, hand hygiene is the cornerstone of infection prevention and control, so we really wanted to include it in the list. But Choosing Wisely Canada Leads felt that it just didn't fit because it's not really a procedure, treatment, or test that could cause harm or lack of benefit in the general sense. And they stress that hand hygiene is something we want to encourage more of, not less. So I did have one-on-one -on -one discussion <laughs> with them to try and plead my case, and they agreed that we could merge it into the embed it in the uh, gloves item, which is good. But uh, whoever had this comment, uh, I would say you are not alone. Um, I must have done hundreds and with my colleagues thousands of uh, educational workshops, events, communities of practice, et cetera, across different settings. And we ask, you know, we often put that question out, what's best, washing with soap and water or alcohol-based hand drug? And um, back, I would say 15 years or so ago, it was really washing with soap and water. You brought out the alcohol-based hand rub when you had an outbreak or something. Um, but the science since around that time and beyond is that in a healthcare setting, alcohol-based hand rub is the gold standard now. It's for a number of reasons. It gives it kills the organisms on your hands instantly. 99.99% of the organisms have an instant kill. And yes, you know, the commensals will grow back eventually, but you've got an instant kill. So what you're doing is you're killing the organisms on your hands with a 15 to 20 second rub, as opposed to washing with soap and water, which is you're washing those organisms off and down the drain. So there's a number of different things to consider. Um, we know that people don't wash their hands as much as they should. Nurses are the biggest healthcare providers. They do the most contact. They are, are the ones who need to do this the most. Studies have shown that if you actually, especially say in a critical care situation, the nurses will be washing their hands four times or more per hour. Um, and in between each intervention, the skin would be off your hands if you washed your hands properly. Um, you know, with proper washing, rubbing, even patting dry with a paper towel as opposed to rubbing, um, it would still you know, it would really do a number on your skin. So it's just not. Not only is it not practical, there's not enough time to do it, but it's also damaging to the skin. The studies have shown that alcohol-based hand rub with a good moisturizer in it, an emollient, actually helps the condition of your hands. Your hands are improved as a result. And the CDC has copious studies on this, but so do others. So um, this was all sort of news, you know, about 10, 15 years ago that started to come to the fore. Um, so, you know, what do we do about that? Well. If your hands are visibly soiled, obviously you have to wash with soap and water. If your hands are feeling sticky and tacky because you've, you've used alcohol-based hand rub so much, there's a buildup, again, you'll need to wash. But um, you don't need a sink, soap, water, towels, garbage, etc. with alcohol-based hand rub. It's just with 15 seconds of rubbing as opposed to a full minute with all the other components, including the 15 seconds of rubbing with washing with soap and water. So there's a number of reasons, therefore, that we recommend alcohol-based hand rub as the gold standard in healthcare, because you're more likely to be able to do it and to do it. And I mean, some of these things are like, just do it or just clean your hands. It's just, just do it, you know? Um, and this is the best way to do it. So that's why I, probably left a few of the other reasons out, but um, you can be rubbing your hands while you're chatting to your patient, resident, or client. You know, hello, Mrs. Smith, I'm looking after you today. I'm just going to take your temperature, or uh, what would you need me to bring into the room for your care? You know, so you're just doing this while you are uh, doing your interactions as well with, it, with the individual. Thanks, Madeline. Uh, we have a question from a participant that's um, uh, related to, I guess, uh, workplace policies and just looking for your advice about how, uh, as nurses, um, we often feel pressured by institutions we work in to come in when ill or have to face penalties with attendance monitoring, pro monitoring programs or um, 
docking and pay and things like that. So what strategies are there to help support nurses when dealing with those issues in the workplace, knowing that it's really important to the patients that we care for that we not come in sick and uh, potentially infect them given that they may be uh, or are likely to be immunocompromised? Well, that's an excellent question, and I think it's a long-standing one that many of us have. Um, if you look at the best practices for infection prevention and control on your provincial, I know the Ontario, BC, um, we all have these, as well as the Public Health Agency of Canada. Administrative supports, uh, including healthy workplace policies, are critical. You can't um, expect people um, to to come, you know, to not come in when they're ill if you don't have anyone to replace them with. So you need to make sure that people don't work sick by making sure that they can be backfilled, that there are people available, that you're not, um, you know, held out to dry because you, you know, went over your sick leave. Because let's face it, those of us particularly, I'm no longer in that category, but with young children at home, they're lovely petri dishes of every germ you can imagine. They come home from school and they infect the whole family. So, um, you know, how can you go to work when you have an infection that can infect the patient, residents, or clients? And, and it's true that we are, as I mentioned before, often the source uh, for these, especially in outbreaks. So the policies need to be there. And um, there are some recommendations within our best practices uh, of, of how you can encourage that. Your occupational health and safety de department uh, and leads are your go-to people for this. Because um, when you think about it, the Occupational Health and Safety Act supersedes even the Emergency Measures, Emergency Management Act. Like people need to be safe in their workplace. and, and um, I know that many of our colleagues are part-time employees and they don't get paid if they're not at work. They don't have sick leave and sick leave may be factored into their hourly rate, but you know, there is a concern, well, I can't pay my bills unless I go in. So you're doing it because you don't want to leave people short or you're doing it because financially you can't afford it. So there needs to be recognition of this and there needs to be support in the workplace and attendance management programs often seem to be contrary to this. So um, I would say resources to help, you know, are through occupational health and safety, uh, also through um, our best practices, which are, we've got a lot of online resources for that. And um, sometimes the, the, the nursing unions as well could, could probably help with that and support that. We certainly don't want people working when they're ill because the outcome to the organization is way worse as well as to the individual. Thanks, Madeline. Um, and so there's a question about what was the biggest challenge in uh, developing this Choosing Wisely list? Well, thank you. Well, um, I think for us it was getting a nice representative team together with a tight timeline because we were told, I think it's I think it was maybe December or January the year before last um, that you know this was coming down the pipe and we needed to get a team together and we just hit the ground running once we did this. So um, with our group, um, IPAC Canada, um, we do have uh, other professionals within our organization. So we do have micro microbiologists, micro lab techs. We have public health inspectors. We have, um, um, you know, practical nurses who may not be members of CNA at this point. Um, and, um, you know, we needed to, we had some, doc had some doctors too. So we had to find people who were representative. So they had to be a nurse, they had to be a CNA member, and they had to be from a broad geographical range. So I could tap a lot of people in Ontario that I know, but that wasn't the point. The point was to, to reach out. And as you know, people are busy. And I mean, it was like January, and you know, people were having outbreaks in their facilities and so on. So we wanted to try and get people from different settings as well as different locations. So to me, that was the most challenging. Um, and I think it, um, maybe that wasn't for the team, but it was for me because I wanted to make sure we had a good mix and good representation. And I think we were, we were very lucky that we did so. I think for the team, the, the uh, challenge was 
again, hit the ground running. What is choosing wisely about? Because most of us have maybe not even heard of it or only superficially heard of it from maybe a risk management point of view or from antimicrobial stewardship, but not nursing or IPAC. So rapid learning curve and, and uh, a lot to do. But thank you to Carrie for keeping us all on, onto our timelines and doing all the background work that, that made it flow. Well, thanks, Madeline. That's, uh, I appreciate that. It was a, um, it, it was a really hardworking group, and uh, it was amazing how it all came together. Uh, we have a question now about um, how can choosing wisely be expanded into practice, if you have any uh, advice on, on that. Yes, yes. I, I think that's, um, that's a very important question. And, and you know how we, we say that research takes an average of 17 years to get into practice or to, uh, you know, elicit actual behavioral change. And um, we don't want 17 years for this. So I think it's really important that we increase awareness. And so um, we're doing this today, but we're also doing it at conferences and so on um, to get the word out there. I would say that if, if each of you who's on the call today could pull up the list, look at them, share them at your team meetings, and discuss how applicable they might be in your particular workplace. Um, the other thing I would say is walk the talk. Once you've read them, think about how you could change your practice, and how you model these or role model these in your work, and, and basically teach by example as well. Um, what resonates with you and your team, not just with our list, but maybe have a look at some of the others. Like, you know, if you work in an orthopedic area, look at the orthopedic list. I know it's physician right now, but, you know, look at, look at that or look at uh, pharmacy or look at, um, you know, the micro list. Uh, have a peek at some of the other lists because um, something there might resonate with you and your team as well. And watch out, of course, for our gerontology and the following nurses nursing lists, too, that are coming from CNA, because they're, the gerontology list is in draft form and um, has, has um, had board approval of CNA at this point, so we hope that that will be soon, um, you know, also up there on the website. But, uh, make, you know, if you can make this your own, and see, I, I really, I love the posters, too, you know, and I, I always think of the catch, uh, sorry, the, the, the mustard one, you know, like, I'm not sure a hot dog is a really good thing when you think about what's in it, everything but the speak. But the idea that it tastes great with a bit of mustard, but when you just dollop it all on, it tastes terrible and it might make you ill. So um, those kind of uh, connections to, uh, or the washing machine with too much uh, soap powder and it's counterproductive. And the things we do very well meaning that actually end up not being so good I love them, the items when they are kind of sound a bit radical, um, you know, like, what? And one of the things, in, if I may say, uh, the gerontology list is about, you know, don't necessarily do two hourly turns. Uh, and to me, it was like, wow, well, I'm a Nightingale nurse. This is ingrained in us. But some people may need them more frequently. Some may need just a gentle repositioning. Some may not need anything for a little bit longer and be allowed to sleep and so on. So things that might take you back when you read it. Like some people sit here about the, about the hand hygiene uh, idea. Like, really? And then you look into it more. Or the um, diabetic testing, to me, was another one. Don't get people who are just on oral diabetic meds in our general nursing list to, to, um, to do, you know, frequent glucometer readings and all this sort of stuff. I thought, gosh, I didn't know these things. So um, yeah, I've been a nurse a long time, and I've been maybe out of the, the front line a bit. but. Um, We've all got things to learn, and um, I think it's uh, great that we can, 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 you know, refresh our learning and share with others. Thanks, Madeline. So I, I just want to recap um, some of the things that Madeline had pointed out. So uh, in terms of Choosing Wisely Canada nursing lists, on the Canadian Nurses Association website, we have the two finalized lists so far. We have the general nursing list entitled Nine Things Nurses and Patients Should Question, and the first specialty list, which of course is the infection prevention and control list that Madeline just spoke to. And, um, and as Madeline had mentioned, the uh, Canadian Gerontological Nurses Association list was just approved at the Canadian Nurses Association Board, so it's going through the final stages of um, 
getting ready to be released and should be released in the next few weeks. Um, and then also, we are in development of two additional nursing lists. Uh, which will be released later this year and early of 2019, and that's um, the Canadian Association of Critical Care Nurses and the Operating Room Nurses of Canada. Uh, and then also on the Canadian Nurses Association website is uh, a list from the Nurse Practitioners Association of Canada, a Choosing Wisely list there. But all in all, um, the Choosing Wisely campaign itself continues to grow. I think there's more than 250 clinician recommendations. So there are a couple of um, questions from people that have come up in the chat pod asking about um, other specific recommendations that are, do not, are not nested in any of um, the nursing lists. And I would encourage you, as Madeline had, to go to the Choosing Wisely website. It's www.choosingwiselycanada.org. And it's very searchable. Um, there's actually just a search box in the middle of the page, similar to Google. And you can just put in what your subject is. Um, if you're looking for something around um, prenatal testing or things like that, the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has uh, a list and probably has some recommendations. Um, and so with more than 250 recommendations and always growing, there is information available um, that spans most specialties. So I would encourage you to check those out, too. And um, thank you, Madeline, for for all of your time and expertise, um, before um, before we move on, uh, Leah, our, our uh, web webinar host, will uh, ask a poll question. Do you see the questions posted there? If you're just able to um, enter your answers. That would be greatly appreciated. That helps us with our um, measurements on the on the webinar and and understanding who's attending and um, how useful the information is. Great, thank you. And so, for more information, if you have questions, the next slide should have. Uh, Madeline's contact information and mine. Um, oh, sorry, I flipped ahead too far. So there you go. There's uh, contact information. And again, of course, this uh, this video um, will be archived later on on our on CNA's YouTube channel. So you can also um, access recordings of previous webinars on CNA's YouTube channel. And you can download files and your certificate of participation now by using the pods that are underneath the presentation in front of you now. And if you weren't aware, uh, the Canadian Nurses Association is having our biennium in Ottawa this year from June 18th to 20th. There will be a Choosing Wisely presentation as well, um, uh, among other amazing presentations about uh, from insight to impact in nursing. So if you haven't yet signed up, consider doing that. And also our next webinar, uh, if you haven't already signed up for that, consider registering for optimizing teamwork using conflict resolution strategies, which will be held on Monday, April the 16th from 12 to 1 Eastern time. And thank you all for your participation today. And Madeline, thank you so much for your presentation. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And if there's any um, questions,